Happy birthday, everyone. I am so excited to be with you on this wonderful 4th of July. A little hot outside. Can you believe we're at that midway point of summer already? The 4th of July, 2012. I'm happy to be your host today, Diane Gatzis Havinga, and we have a very special treat for you today. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to tour Gettysburg with our resident historian, Jim Pococco, who's a West Springfield Hall of Fame history teacher. And so what we've done today is put together a mini tour of Gettysburg with Jim Pococco. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and have a wonderful 4th of July. These are two mini balls. M-I-N-I-E-T. It's French. The it's from a Frenchman by the name of Binet. Like you take them in the in English language, they become known as mini balls. They are not balls at all. They are conical shaped. Over a million of these were expended here at the Battle of Gettysburg over the three days of fighting. These are from the battlefield. You, you, there are groups that still go around, poking around legally, and dig them up. The one with the three rings is a Union mini ball. The one with the small ring, the two rings, is a Confederate mini ball. Feel them, because these, this is what would hit you, okay? Now remember, one of the things about the Civil War is that tactics had not been able to catch up to the changes of weapons. Weapons develop much faster than the actual adjustments that need to be made on a battlefield or in a war situation. So everybody, you know, you're looking at the movie Gettysburg and you're saying, why are these guys shooting like 30 feet from each other? Well, that's because the old style of fighting was you had a single round ball that came out of a non-rifled barrel of a musket and wobbled and didn't have a real trajectory. So you needed to mass as many guys as possible into one space so that these balls that come out of the barrel wobbly would have some effect. Well, now, by 1863, we have the rifled musket, okay? The barrel has a groove in it, the bullet spins in the groove and is much more accurate and much more deadly. Uh, reason the Civil War would have to see a lot of amputations is because if you got hit with this in an arm or a leg, it's going to smash the bone. This is not the age of modern medicine as we know. In fact, the very first medical manual ever accepted by European physicians as a major contribution to medical literature by the United States comes out of the Civil War. Wars are always great for medical science because the way the changes are affected. After World War II, the biggest medical profession that emerged was the profession of physical therapists. All right? This medical manual that, that American doctors from the Union Army wrote after the Civil War dealt with things that had never been done anywhere before, such as how to take bones and recess them and take the two ends and put them together and, and heal them that way. Talked about the use of um, state hospitalizations, how to use hospitals, how to build a hospital. This is a huge event. Remember, 625,000 people died in 18, between 1861 and 1865. That's 2% of the population. How many people did I say that would translate to today? Did I tell you that? If that, if, if, if the same 2% of the American population were to die today, it'd be 5 to 6 million people. That's how cataclysmic this war is. I take you to this spot because this is the spot where on July 1, General Reynolds is killed. If you look to the right of the sun, you see the cupola of the, of the, the Theological Seminary. Buford rides back here to this area to hold the ground. Reynolds brings up the first corps, they march through town, they get out here, they cross these fields over here, and in the lead element of the first corps, in the lead element of the first corps are, are members of the Iron Brigade.
If you look over this way, we are looking east. See that field, that triangular field in front of us? That's the peach orchard. That's where General Sickles, on the afternoon of July 2nd, moved his forces a mile in front of the line, looking for high ground. The farm behind it, the farm behind it is the Trossel Farm. The Trossel Farm is where all those photographs of the dead horses that we showed you were taken. To the left of the Trossel Farm, and we'll go to it later, is the spot where General Sickles lost his leg. All right, if you look over to this side, you can see the water tower where Cemetery Ridge is, and you come down the tree line, and that's the center of the Union line. To my right are the round tops. The big one to the right is big round top. The one that is clear is little round top. Now, little round top, little round top had actually been cleared in the spring of 1863. Farmers went up with their axes and saws cleared off the brush because they were cutting down the trees to make firewood. So that actually was basically denuded by, 18, by the summer of 1863. So when the Confederates hit it, they hit it going up against the line without having to deal with trees on that side. That's not the case with what happens with Oates and his soldiers from Alabama. Uh, the big monument straight ahead is the Pennsylvania Monument the largest monument on the battlefield. Behind us, west, is the Blue Ridge Mountain Range. And it's on the other side of those mountains. It's on the other side of those mountains that Robert E. Lee, it's on the other side of those mountains that Robert E. Lee brought his troops using the mountains as a screen to get into Pennsylvania. Here's what Theodore Garris says. Our regiment mustered about 350 men. Company B from Piscataqua County, commanded by the Captain Walter G. Morrill, was ordered to deploy to our front our skirmishers. They boldly advanced down the slope and disappeared from our view. The skirmishers must have advanced some 30 or 40 rods to the rocks and trees, but we have no indication of seeing the enemy. But look, 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 exclaimed half a hundred men in our regiment at the same moment, and no wonder, for right in our front, between us and our skirmishers, whom they have probably captured, we see the line of the enemy. They are rushing on, determined to turn and crush the left of our line. Colonel Chamberlain, with rare sagacity, understood the moment they uh, understood the movement they were making and bent back the left flank of our regiment until the line formed almost at a right angle with the colors at this point. How can I describe the scenes that follow? Imagine if you can nine small companies of infantry in the form of a right angle on the extreme flank of an army, put there to hold the key of the entire position. Stand firm, ye boys from Maine, for not once in a century are men permitted to bear such responsibilities for freedom and justice, for God and humanity, as are now placed upon you. And then he goes on and on and on and on and talks about it. Then he talks about Chamberlain's, um, uh, uh, the enemy was firing terrible upon us, his superior forces giving him a great advantage. The air seemed to be alive with lead. The lines at times were so near each other that the hostile gun barrels almost touched. At one time there was a brief lull in the carnage and our shattered line was closed up, but soon the contest raged again with renewed fierceness. Many of our companies suffered terribly. Okay, now, um, let me just continue down. Okay, Chamberlain uh, talks about the charge here. Uh, our ammunition is nearly all gone. This is Garrett still writing. Our ammunition is nearly all gone and we are using the cartridges from the boxes of our wounded comrades. A critical moment has arrived and we can remain as we are no longer. We must advance or retreat. It must be the latter, but how can it be the former? Colonel Chamberlain understands how it can be done. The order is given. Fix bayonets and the steel shanks of the bayonets rattle upon the rifle battles. Charge bayonets, charge. Every man understood in a moment that the movement was our only salvation. But there is a limit to human endurance. And for a brief moment, the order was not obeyed, and the line, the little line, seemed to quail under the fearful fire that was being poured upon it. 
Lieutenant H.S. Melcher, an officer who had worked his way up in the ranks, saw the situation and did not hesitate. With a cheer and a flash of his sword that sent an inspiration along the line, full ten face paces to the front, he sprang. Ten paces more, more than half the distance between the hostile lines. Come on, come on, come on, boys, he shouts. The color sergeant and the brave color guard follow, and with one wild yell of anguish wrung from its tortured heart, the regiment charged. Now, Theodore Garrish writes this. Does this sound like he was here? Does it sound like he saw this? Yeah. Theodore Garrish is in a hospital in Philadelphia on July 2nd, 1863. He is not here. Yet his story is the story that Ken Burns buys. It's the story that Ken Burns buys because Michael Shara, the author from, of Killer Angels, buys. And the whole story of Gettysburg gets changed. Now, he didn't foresee that this was going to happen. This happens because up until, you have to understand the progress. In 1973, when the Killer Angels came out, the United States had just pulled out of Vietnam. Even though that novel wins a Pulitzer Prize, nobody knows about it. Nobody wants to touch anything that has to do anything remotely with military. It's not until, it's not really until Ken Burns, until the, the book gets a little bit of traction in the 1980s, and then begins to be read by more and more people. But it's not until Ken Burns puts it in the movie that it's suddenly Chamberlain, who is very few people know prior to the novel, is launched into the stratosphere of Civil War superheroes. And believe me, there is a cult of Civil War superheroes. Guys that you'll go everywhere, you'll find them on t-shirts, be Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, um, and Chamberlain is one of those guys. The problem is, Historically, this is what has been taken as gospel truth is what happened here, but the guy that wrote it wasn't even here, yet writes it from a position as if he was actually here on July 2nd, 1863. So again, you've got to be really careful with your sources. And what happened? The Park Service, nobody came out to the for, for, until the movie Gettysburg came out, maybe a little bit before that. Nobody in the Park Service, visitors never came. Nobody wanted to know about the 20th Maine. Ken Burns, and the movie Gettysburg, the Park Service was forced to cut all this stuff back. This monument, when I first brought a class here back in the 80s, this was all treed in. This was not clear because nobody came back here. They had to reinterpret the battlefield to accommodate all the visitors that wanted to see where the 20th Maine fought. So again, it's part of this whole myth building. Um, the other question is, is, did Chamberlain order a charge? That's a big issue that historians have. We know the charge happened, but it may have been a happening as opposed to an event. It, it may have been something that just was by natural sequence of fighting took place. And then Chamberlain, when he writes in his memoirs, now you got to remember, Chamberlain's got an edge over other people. He's a college professor who teaches rhetoric and logic, and he knows how to write. And after the war, he writes, yeah, that's what happened, because you got to remember, you have to understand the culture in which these people live, okay? They're out writing their memoirs, their memoirs are selling books, and they all believe they're doing the right thing by recording the history. Well, it doesn't matter that 20 years have passed and you've forgotten what's happened or that you've changed the events, but not unlike people today, they're willing to expand the story to make themselves look good. And the quote that I gave you that you have that journal entry on, on, on Chamberlain about, um, about battlefields and their position on battlefields, that comes from the dedication of this monument in the 1880s, where Chamberlain gives this very eloquent speech, which then becomes codified as gospel truth after Gettysburg and Killer Angels come out. I was here with another historian, uh, a, a very good historian, his name is William Frazzanito, and he's the guy that has done a huge 30 years of work on just the photographs taken at Gettysburg where he goes out and he can take people, here's the photograph in 1863, here it is today. Well, he and I were in this conversation about this and he said, he goes, you know, he said, there were 20th Mains happening all over this battlefield and for to lay that in a story as dramatic as the Ken Burns film was is really unfair because it doesn't, it doesn't allow, it doesn't tell you stories of other regiments that were doing equally heroic things on other parts of the battlefield. The point is this, that film, it's a film, both the Ken Burns film and the movie Gettysburg, they're motion picture, they're film, okay? 
artists like Ken, Ken Burns will tell you up front, he says, I am not a historian, I am a filmmaker. Filmmakers don't necessarily worry about what's real. They're trying to manipulate you, not in a bad way, they want to get you to feel something. They want you to, you know, feel the depth of something. So they may stray a little bit from the stories. But what happens is, because we are such a media society, everybody goes to the movies and thinks that's real. On, Ju on July 3rd. At 8.30, at, at 8.30, Mr. Snow of Company B, a guy named Mr. Snow and Company B, tells me he thinks he saw my brother, and I accompany him to the spot, and I find my dear brother dead. A shell struck him on the top of his head and passed out through his back, cutting him basically in two. The poor fellow, fellow did not know what hit him. I secured his pocketbook, watch, diary, knife, etc., and with William E. Cundy and J.S. Brown, buried him, buried him at 10 o'clock a.m., 350 paces west of a road, which passes north and south of the house of Jacob Hummelbaugh, which is back that way, right? Um, uh, I, I buried him past the house of jo Jacob Hummelbaugh and John Swisher, a free Negro, an equi distant from each and by a stone wall where he fell about a mile south of Gettysburg. I placed a board on his head, which I inscribed. No useless coffin enclosed his breast, nor in sheet, nor in shroud, we bound him, but he lay like a warrior taking his rest with his shelter tent around him. That was a common poem that most soldiers in the Union Army and Confederate Army knew that when they buried a loved one on the battlefield, that was an inscription sort of done as a benediction. Um, Henry, the surviving brother, gave the complete inscription on the headboard when he makes his last entry into Isaac's diary. So he gets his brother's diary, his brother's dead, gets his diary. He dates it July 4th, 1863, and the last inscription reads, the owner of this diary was killed by a shell at about sunset on July 2nd, 1863. His face was towards the enemy. Following is inscribed on a board at his head, I.L. Taylor, 1st Minnesota, is buried 10, 10 o'clock a.m. on July 3rd, 1863, by his brother, Sergeant P.H. Taylor, Company E, 1st Minnesota Volunteers. When the 1st Minnesota goes out into the field here to hit those soldiers from Alabama, they are, they are 264 men. <clears throat> Within five minutes, there are only 47 left. Okay, um, It buys the Union Army the time that it needs to get more troops shifted over to the field. Now, we can argue that the same thing that the 1st Minnesota does here is the same thing that the 20th Maine does up on Little Round Top. There are all these engagements, very desperate engagements, going on all over this battlefield. Okay? And the point of giving you the picture is to put a real face on this. There are two guys, those, those, that photograph I believe was taken in Washington, D.C. when they arrived there in 1862, or 1860, yeah, 1862, and the brother's dead and the other brother goes out to bury him. So the idea here is to understand that while these are places of sites, they're also deeply, deeply places of, of, of the human experience at the extreme that I would hope none of us would ever have to encounter in our lives. During the Battle of Gettysburg, her husband was off to war. Elizabeth had her father who helped her run the cemetery. She first came across the rebels June 26th. Rebels told Elizabeth to not be scared because they were going to hurt her like the Yankees did. The Rebels destroyed many surrounding places. Elizabeth would watch from the upstairs of her house. She could see the Union soldiers come from every direction. She baked so many loaves of bread trying to feed all that came. The little boys that fetched water for Elizabeth had blisters on their hands from constantly retrieving water for the tons of different tins and buckets Elizabeth had for the men. They came to ask what um, two different types of roads were, and no one would go because they were too young or too old. So Elizabeth went, and they like safely protected her, and she told them which roads were which, and then they brought her home. Um, later that day, a man of, Gen of General Howard came to tell Elizabeth that General Howard, General Sickles, and General Slocum would be coming for dinner. Elizabeth had no bread left, so she baked cakes for the generals. They didn't arrive till 12 o'clock at night. General Howard had Elizabeth's things brought to the cellar, which was very kind of him. The next morning, heavy firing began at 4 a.m. They all went to the cellar of the cemetery house. 
Around 7 a.m., a man of General Howard informed Elizabeth and everyone else to leave and get as far away as they could in 10 minutes. They had nowhere to go and were very hungry because they had given all their bread to the soldiers. Later, the fighting had stopped. They went back to the cemetery house. They found that their pig was gone and there were um, wounded soldiers all in the house and one sleeping too. They left without much and found the wells to be broken. Um, another woman and Elizabeth talked to officers and they didn't seem keen on them com on the women complaining to them. They went and found two crocks full of milk. They hid one and brought one to the sick. When they went back t for the other, it was gone. They got yeast and flour and they were able to bake bread with um, that night. They received a whole barrel of, of flour and were able to make much more bread. Soldiers paid Elizabeth one to three dollars for one loaf. They went home after four days and were met with quite a surprise. The house had no window glass and the items she had stored in the cellar with the help of General Howard were all gone. There were so many soldiers, so many dead soldiers all around the outside of the house. Altogether, Elizabeth and her father buried 105 soldiers. There were also 15 dead horses in the front of the cemetery house and 19 next to the cemetery. Elizabeth um, was a very strong woman during the time of this war. And three months after the war, she had a baby. After that, though, she was a very sick lady and she died on October 17, 1907 at the age of 75. Of 15-year-old George Gitt. Now, George Gitt was a local kid. Lincoln was his hero. He gets to the cemetery in the morning before the ceremonies begin. He climbs underneath the speaker's platform, okay, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits. And then he, as an 85-year-old man, he would write this about what he says, what happened here. Um, three score, paraphrasing Lincoln, three score and ten years have passed away since that address fell upon the ears of an assemblage that stood, as I well remember, motionless and silent. Many bowed their heads and almost without exception men doffed their hats. They mistook the speech for a prayer. A group of Negroes moaned forth an amen after each pause. I, a boy of 15, intent upon being as close to Lincoln as was physically possible without being on top of the platform, had concealed myself earlier in the day among the huge store boxes that formed the foundations of the structure. And during the delivery of the address, I stood with my heart in my mouth, literally at the feet of my hero. Early in the evening of the previous day, I had heard the shrill whistle of a locomotive at an hour when no train has ever entered our village, uh, our village of Hanover, which lies about 14 miles east of Gettysburg and a mile or two farther north of the Mason-Dixon line. Immediately I hastened toward the station, but not alone, for others had heard the whistling and were equally curious. To my vast surprise, I discovered that the special train on which Lincoln was journeying to Gettysburg had developed a hot box and was therefore being shunted from the main line into the Hanover siding. Of course, some had assumed that there would be no stop after a junction point 10 miles to the east, and consequently, earlier in the day, had gone there hoping to get a glimpse of the president. But enough townsmen had remained at home so that when a few minutes after the whistle blast blew, a crowd surrendered the coach in which Lincoln sat writing the latter part of his address on the top of a high hat serving as a makeshift test desk. This is a guy who's 85 years old when he's writing this. I mean, this may be where that sort of the train writing the story on a train comes from. There was no cheering. The battle of the crowd was subdued. The mo locomotive with the car forward car of which the offending axle was a part rolled off to the repair shop. Then a voice was raised, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, come forth. Your children want to see you. The crowd gave way and the minister of the village, Lutheran Church, uh, the minister of the village, Lutheran Church, Reverend Allerman, continued his appeal, stepped close to the coach. A moment later, Lincoln's tall figure appeared in the doorway. Stooping so that the crown of his head would clear the lintel, he strode out on the platform, smiled sladly, and slowly descended the lower step. I was close by. In order that I might touch the skirts of Lincoln's coat, I squirmed beneath the coach and wriggled between its wheels, and, I emerged, and as I emerged, my shoulder brushed the president's knee. The great and kindly hand patted my proud, happy head. Thrilled and strangely moved, I forthwith made my mind to go to Gettysburg the next day, even though I should have to walk. With his eyes still fixed on me, Lincoln began to speak. And while he spoke, his thoughts seemed to be far away and unrelated to the words he uttered. For that day, his mountainous troubles were piqued by a distressing anxiety due to the critical condition of his little son, Tad. So here you've got somebody who actually encountered Lincoln in a very unusual way here at Gettysburg, who's not much 
younger than you guys and who is very teenagey. 